you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Proverbs chapter 11. We are in the midst of a series on money, and we have covered thus far three topics. Um, we have talked about whose it is. It's all His. It's all God's. The Word tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that He owns everything. It's His. Uh, we see in the New Testament that God has appointed us as stewards of His stuff. Uh, we talked about how you get money matters. It's important to God. Honesty, integrity, working hard, not being slack. We talked about what you do with the money matters. Um, God, God has a lot to say on the topic of money. Unfortunately, the majority of what we hear talked about in church is give. Well, guess what we're talking about today? Yeah. Give. Okay. Now, in the midst of this series, I don't want to ever shy away from an uncomfortable topic in Scripture. Okay. So before we get into this, there are a couple of disclaimers I want to lay out. First, I have no idea what you give. Okay? I have no idea how many of you tithe. I, I, I don't look each week to see who's putting checks in. Uh, that's not my business. Alright? So, what I'm going to say, I'm not targeting anyone. So if I step on your toes, it's God's fault. <laughs> Alright? Because I'm just going to take what His Word says. Let me, let me rephrase. I'm going to take what I understand His Word to say. And I'm going to share it with you. So if, if you get a little singed, ask God why you're hurting. Okay? So I'm not targeting anyone. Conversely, I'm targeting everyone. Because His Scripture is meant for us. Right? Right? I mean, is there anyone in here that His Word is not for? Because if you believe that, you're in the wrong place. Okay? So, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, giving. Proverbs chapter 11. We're going to look down in verse 24. Now remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago, Proverbs are not necessarily promises. Proverbs are observations. Solomon, who is considered the wisest of all men, was simply recounting what he observed generally happens in a given set of circumstances. Okay? So, you can't take this and apply it to your life and say, I'm standing on this verse, because the very next one that you may not want to stand on also applies. Okay? So, verse 24... One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and who waters will himself be watered. Now, I told you guys that the, the genesis of this series was, was, I listened to a series by James McDonald, and, and I, I'm going to share with you right now, this one section, I'm deviating quite a bit from some of the things that he said, because he and I have different opinions about the interpretation of Scripture, okay? But I, I want to share with you 
some principles about giving that you may or may not know. All right? So, first, in verse 24, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Generous giving leads to abundance. You see that? Now that he's observing this. This is what he sees happening. He sees that one who keeps his hand open has his hand available to receive, but one who keeps his hand closed cannot receive. Okay? The way you can look at it is this. You can look at your life as a freshwater spring, or you can look at your life as a stagnant pond. If you are a fresh flowing spring, the water is continually moving. And as it comes in and as it goes out, as it goes out, more comes in. It's a continual flow. And that water is refreshing. And it's a blessing. But if you only allow the water to come in and you don't let it go anywhere, what happens? Stagnates. Gets nasty stuff growing all over it. It stinks. The only way to fix that is to get the water to flow out as well. And so I want you to consider... Are you a fresh flowing spring or are you more of a stinky, stagnant pond? When we first started talking about money, I told you that it was a test. This right here is one of the biggest tests in our lives. <clears throat> Last couple of weeks, we looked at the passage in Luke 16 about the, the uh, dishonest manager. And we got down to the end of it and Jesus is telling this parable and he says, You cannot serve two masters, for you will love the one and hate the other, or you will despise the one and cherish the other. But you can't serve both. And I would put to you today that how you deal with what God gives you is more a revelation of your heart than how loud you sing, how well you dress, how many scriptures you can quote. I would put to you today that if you really have God on the throne of your heart, money's not as important to you. Now, I'm not saying money is not important. We all understand that you have bills to pay. Sometimes we foolishly have bills to pay. Okay? I've never seen a people so eager to become slaves. Because His Word tells us that the debtor is slave to the creditor. Oh man, I can have that right now and pay five times what it's worth over the course of ten years. But by golly, I have it now. You'll still be paying for it when you need the next one. But we want that. We think that's good. <clears throat> Generous giving starts with tithing. <gasps> I said it. There it is. It's out in the open. <laughs> tithing! <clears throat> Some people think that's one of them churchy curse words. <laughs> what does tithe mean? A tenth. Ten percent. You could say, you know, I go to church and I pay my ten percent. Well, that's kind of a misstatement, isn't it? Because whose is it? God's. It's not yours. God is allowing you to hold His 90%. Okay? So, first, there's a number of things that I want to go through so that we understand 
what the Bible has to say about tithing. Because there's, there's three different areas of giving that I want to address. Today we're going to deal primarily with tithing. Okay? But I believe that there are three areas that Scripture addresses very clearly that a Christian should be giving in. One, tithing. Okay? We're going to talk about that today. Two, giving. And three, alms. Now, I'm going to separate giving and alms, although if you look in the dictionary, their, their definitions are almost identical. I'm separating for the purposes of understanding. So when I use a particular term, you guys understand where I'm going with it. Okay? And we're going to talk about giving and alms later. Okay? First thing, tithing is literally translated as a tenth. This is both in the Old and the New Testament. Okay? Number two, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Flip over there with me if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 14. We're going to bounce around quite a bit today, and it's necessary because I want you to see that this principle is all throughout God's Word. A lot of people go, oh, that's an Old Testament thing. No, not quite. Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'm going to pick up in verse 22. Deuteronomy 14, 22. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God, in the place that He will choose to make His name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind the money up in your hand and go to the place your Lord God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. And you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. Now, we see this as the establishment of the law in the Old Testament. There are a couple of things that I want to draw out from here just, just to kind of lay before you. First, it's year after year. It's ongoing. It's not a one and done kind of deal. Second, where does the tithe go? God's house. God's house. Third, there's a principle here that we need to understand. When the children of Israel were settled in the land of Israel, their first fruits were to be taken immediately up to the temple. Well, that could prove a hardship because sometimes the temple was far enough away that it would prevent them from being able to do the full harvest. So God is laying down a condition whereby they can still pay their tithe and not bankrupt themselves in doing so. And what he's saying is you take yours, you trade it in, you sell it for coins, you take those coins and you travel up to Jerusalem, you buy the equivalent of, of what it was, and there's your tithe, your offerings. And then at the very bottom, he adds a little, uh, an interesting phrase. He says, And you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. What does that mean? These are the people that God has commissioned, that he has called. It's actually a very cool story. I'm going to digress for just a minute. Join me on this rabbit trail. When God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he did so at the cost of every firstborn Egyptian. Okay? But that cost needed to be paid back by the Jews. God required of them because He took the life of every firstborn from Egypt. He required of the Jews every firstborn to be given to Him as His. Okay? That was people... Flocks, herds, all the firstborn was his. And then when they came to the actually settling this out, how this would be determined, God chose the tribe of Levi 
to be the replacement for all of those first born. Okay? And, and when they did the numbering, they did the census, they found out that the tribe of Levi did not have sufficient firstborn males to cover all of the rest of them. So the tribes had to come together and they had to pay the difference to make up the amount. And that money was put into the pool for the use for the tabernacle. Okay, God is very specific in how he does his accounting. Very specific. Okay? Much more so than we are. God required that because the cost was the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of Israel would be his, but that so that he could have a group that was set unto himself. Basically, I think it's just to make it easy for the Jews. He took the tribe of Levi. And he said, these will be mine. They will have no inheritance among you. They are given towns throughout the different tribes, the different areas. But, but they were not given land parcel to them. Okay? So what God required of the children of Israel was that they would pay part of their tithes to the supplementing of the Levites, who were the workers in God's house, who took care of the tabernacle first. And then later when the tabernacle was done, they weren't moving it anymore. They reestablished them as, as the workers. They assisted the priests. He established them as the, the door watch. He established them as judges throughout the land. There were a number of things that he called them to do. They were the ones that worshipped. They led the worship in the temple. That, that it never ceased. 24 hours a day, there was always worship going up to heaven. So, God is very exacting in what he says here. But if you notice, it comes off the top. And if you can't take it there right away, what do you do? He says, you go and you cash this in and you get the coins... And then you take the coins when you can and you hustle down to Jerusalem and there you take care of paying it. Okay? So, there's another principle laid out in the Old Testament for you. Uh, Psalm 24, 1. Uh, this is the symbolization that God owns everything. That's a, the verse that I quoted for you a little earlier. It's all His. So if you really believe that it's all His, then don't you think God is being really generous and giving you 90%? You say, oh man, but you don't know what I had to do to work for this 100%. No, I don't, but God does. And Scripture tells us that you would not have even been able to do that if God had not enabled you to do so. So, it symbolizes God's ownership of everything. Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to flip over there. This is right after um, a, a passage that we quote all the time. Everybody remembers, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean under your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your, uh, your path straight. Everybody, I mean, you hear that quoted all the time, right? Okay, but look down two verses later. Three verses later. Verse 9. So we're in Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be worse, bursting with wine. Now, I've heard people say, oh, that was back in the agricultural, the agrarian society, and it was the first fruits of us. No, he says your wealth. Because not everybody was a farmer even back then. People had all kinds of crafts and trades that they engaged in to make a culture that would thrive. Okay? So they had people that did things like cleaning up the refuse. You know, trashmen. You ever think about that? That in God's kingdom there were people that their job was to be the trashmen? No, somebody had to take care of it. They had to haul the stuff off and get it burned and get it taken care of. Okay? So what were they supposed to bring? I don't think God wants 10% of your trash. Okay? So, well, number five. This is what I want to spend. Five and six, I actually want to spend the most of our time on today. Number one, tithing is a universal principle. Okay? It is not bound up in the law. And then when Jesus 
has superseded the law, we're set free from tithing. It's, that's not how it works. Does anybody remember in Scripture when the first tithe was offered? Can anybody think of when that was? Oh, I, okay. What was that again? Yeah. Abraham and Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Abraham was coming back. They had just overthrown their enemy. He had gotten back his people. He had gotten back their wealth. He had taken the wealth from the enemy. And he's coming back and he comes across the high priest Melchizedek who is a foreshadow of, of Jesus to come. Now, it's interesting because here is Abraham whom God has chosen to create for himself a people and yet here is Abraham bowing down before Melchizedek and he offers to him a tenth of everything that he took. Okay? Now Abraham is moved in his heart to honor the man of God and he gives him a tithe. Ten percent. Just right off the top. Okay? He was under no obligation. We see nothing in Scripture where they're told, hey man, you come across a man of God, give him 10% of what you got. We don't see that principle laid out before this point. We see that he was moved to do so. Okay? So, this is 400 years before the law. Okay? It's the same idea as the principle of the Sabbath rest. God created everything in six days. On the seventh day, He rested. He required that people would take that seventh day and rest. Okay? It's a principle. Now, when the law came along, that principle was wrought into the law. But now that we have a higher calling, that, that principle is still in effect. If you work seven days a week, you are going to forsake much of the blessing that God has for you. If you refuse to give unto God the 10% that He has desired of you, as a matter of fact, I'm going to change that word, that He has required of you, you are cutting yourself off of the blessing of God. Okay? So, it is a principle that is far beyond the directive. It's the way things work. It's the way God set things up to work. For example, it may not make you happy, but I guarantee you if you have a car, you pay money to put gas in your car. Why are you so foolish as to pay money to put gas in your car? Because if you don't put gas in your car, you don't go anywhere. The way the car was designed to work is it needs some kind of energy to make it go. I had to change that because you guys got one of those weird cars. There's some of you guys in here that have those hybrid thingies. It requires energy. Okay? Now, you may not like the price of gas. But if you want the car to go, you got to do it, right? It's a principle. The designers of that automobile have designed it such that in order to go, it needs the fuel. It's a principle. I guarantee you that most of you in here at some point today will eat something. If not today, probably tomorrow, at some point in the future, you will eat. Why? I'm not going to eat, by golly! God can't tell me what to do! What's the principle? Well, if you don't eat, you starve. You become less effective. Eventually, you die. It is a principle that God has established because that's the way he wants it to work. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit more about why I believe he did that here in a minute. But you have to understand first that God has desired it to work this way. Alright?
I mentioned a minute ago that it was a part of the law. We read that in Deuteronomy. We see that referenced again throughout the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. But one of the things that I heard somebody say a while back when we were talking about tithing was, hey, Jesus never addressed it. So obviously it doesn't apply. Wrong. Wrong. Did, did you know that Jesus talked about tithing? Did you know that in the New Testament it refers to Jesus as having tithed? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says that he knew no sin. Okay? You, we understand that God sent Jesus. He was born a Jew. He was born under the law that he might fulfill the law. Okay? Now, if tithing was a matter of the law, and Jesus in no way sinned, you suppose he tithed? <gasps> Matter of fact, you look at all the requirements of the law, and he met every one of them perfectly and was without sin. And not only did he meet the physical obligation of the law, but he met the moral obligation of the law and still did not sin. So I'm guessing he didn't grumble when he tithed. He didn't try to negotiate his way out of 10%. Now, I I'm sorry, guys. i, I got to share this with you. This is a thing that I, I have a very strong personal feeling about. I've heard other pastors say, hey, you know, if 10% is a problem, go 5%. I'm sorry. They're wrong. Nowhere in Scripture does it give us permission to rewrite the requirements of God. Nowhere. So when God says 10%, it is my firm belief that God is not asking for four. Okay? It, it is my firm belief that when God asks for 10%, He wants 10%. When, when God tells us, you know, don't steal, He doesn't give us room for the caveat, well, in these conditions it's okay to steal. When he says don't commit adultery, he doesn't give us these ways to bend and manipulate around the law so that we can still uphold the law and still do what we want. When he says something is so, it's just so. It's just the way it is. Okay? So when Jesus walked on the earth as a man, every year, as was required by the law, he tithed. But I'm going to go you one better. Well, you know, if that's such a big deal, how come it's never talked about? It is. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 11. Because there's a little passage in there that God made jump out at my face when I was struggling with the issue of tithing. Starting in verse 37, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kind of catch you up. We're actually going to pick up in 42. But in verse 37, um, a Pharisee comes to Jesus. And you know, Scripture says that the Jews are a stiff-necked and a stubborn people. And if you ever have any doubt of that, look at how many times the Pharisees tried to trip Jesus up and, and ended up flat on their faces. And yet, they kept coming back. Okay? So a Pharisee comes... And he asked Jesus to eat with him. And so they go to the table. And, and uh, the Pharisee is, is kind of pointing out some, some issue that is traditional, but not necessarily a law issue. Because keep in mind, the Pharisees upheld not just the written law, but also all of the oral traditions that came on top of the law. Okay? And then getting down to verse 42, Jesus says something that's really interesting. You know, you, you would think... They would learn to not address him as a Pharisee because when they did, they tended to get in trouble. He says, 
But woe to you Pharisees. He's talking about the entire group of them. For you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. Well, that, you, you stop right there. It kind of sounds like he's knocking them down for tithing, right? But he, Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, these you ought to have done, what? Justice and the love of God. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Do you see what he's saying here? Let me draw you a picture. The Pharisees were very, very public about their tithing. As a matter of fact, we, we read at one time, Jesus is sitting out uh, at the temple and, and the place where the tithes are brought up and the offerings are given. And, and he sees all these people coming up and they make a big show of it. And they're, they're waving around their offering and they bring it in and everybody's like, huh, man, they gave $12.42. Wow. And then remember the widow comes up and, and she puts in her two small coins and, and Jesus is more impressed with her than he is with any of the other offering because she gave out of her desperation. She gave out of her need. Okay, and, and these other guys, they're making a show of it. They want the adulation. They want the approbation. They want the applause of man. Okay, But what he's saying here is, okay, you guys do this and, and, and I think he's doing it in such a way that they know you're making a big show out of this. This, you're, you're not all about honoring God. You're about honoring yourself and honoring God. And then he shames them by saying, but you've neglected justice and the love of God. So he says, you have to do these things. You have to provide justice. You have to give justice. You have to love God. But you can't neglect the former things either. It amazes me how many people that I hear that say, oh, Jesus never talked about tithing. Well, there it is. What Bible are you reading? That's, I mean, I had read the Bible every year from the time I was about 12 years old. I read the entire Bible through every year on a different program. And yet it wasn't until I was almost 30 that that jumped out and bit me in the face. And, and I want to share with you why. Because Christy and I were really struggling. You know, when, when we got married, uh, in the span of five years, we had three children and two major operations. And we had a lot of medical bills. And we were both college students, so we were going to college, racking up more bills, and working whatever jobs we could find, which was not high-paying jobs. And every month, we would sit down and we would look at the amount of money that we had coming in, and we'd look at the greater amount that needed to go out, and we didn't have enough to tithe. God, I can't give you 10% because I've got 100% and I, I'm still not enough. And, and Christy explained it like this. If we didn't pay our tithe, God wasn't going to call us on the phone and tell us what lousy people we were. Because we had debt collectors calling two, three times a week. Hey, where's our money? Hey, I don't know. If you can tell me, I'll give it to you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, if you're in on the secret, let me know. And, and so that was an easy one to not pay. You didn't pay the electric, guess what? They would turn your electric off. You didn't pay the rent, guess what? You had to move. You didn't pay to put gas in your car, you had to walk. So we'd list out our bills, and then we'd look at the generosity of God and say, well, you know, He loves me. So we didn't pay our tithes. And it seemed like we just got further and further and further behind the eight ball. And now this is an interesting thing because growing up I was always a tither. And, and then Christian and I had to sit down and we had to just confront the fact that even with our 100% between, between us we were working five jobs. Okay? And going to school. And homeschooling kids. So we were running around, you know the phrase, like chickens with their heads cut off? I don't know that I ever had one to begin with. You know? So, we were looking at the principle of tithing, and we knew it was necessary. And we knew we needed to get back into tithing. And so, we just said, okay, God, here it is. The money comes in right off the top. 
Now, you know, I heard somebody say once, a pastor that uh, I sat under for a while, he said, you know, people always ask him, do you tithe off of the gross or do you tithe off of the net? And his answer was, well, do you want gross blessings or net blessings? <laughs> I disagree with him. I believe you tithe off of the top. Okay? Because the taxes are just another bill, right? Health insurance is just another bill. Your, your retirement is just another bill. That money come in, and you're, you're fooling yourself if you don't think God holds that to account, because that's the amount of money that came in. So we're looking at this, and we're looking at all of these bills that we can't meet with 100% of what we have, and we, we take it out, and, and we, we put it in the offering, and we say, okay, God, here's yours. This is what you've required of us. Now, I want to share something with you. Turn with me to Malachi. Okay? Because, see, God has given us a principle that he engrafted into the law that Jesus then fulfilled. And here we sit today with the principle that still guides our money. Remember I told you this is a test. <clears throat> it's a test because God wants to know, do you trust him or do you trust your bank? So down in verse 6, chapter 3 of Malachi, this is the Lord speaking through Malachi. He says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Now first let's, let's establish this principle, what God is laying down before what we're going to get to. The first thing that he says is that I'm not changing. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not going to change. Okay? And, but, but that's to our good. Because he says, because of this, you're not consumed. If God changed, think about if he was a fickle God. Think if he was as temperamental as, say, oh, us. Oh, we'd be in so much trouble, wouldn't we? Man, I, I probably wouldn't make it out of bed in the morning before he smote me. Smited? Smith. <laughs> before he squished me. Okay? But thankfully, he doesn't change. Then he says, From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes. Now, what were the statutes given? They were given so that they would know that He is a holy God and He is calling for Himself a holy people, a people separate from the rest of the world. Okay? And He said, but you turned aside from these. And then, then He gives a, a promise here. He says, return to Me and I will return to you. But you're the one that has to turn. You're the one that has to make the turn. Okay, so when you're walking this way and God says, return to me, and you go, hey God, catch up! I need you, you got my back? No, he doesn't, because he's still standing over here where you departed from him. But as soon as you turn around, I guarantee you he's going to meet you right there. That's what he says. That's his promise. I will return to you. And then they say, well, how shall we return? Then God answers, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we re robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions. Now some, some people have a, a different translation. What does yours say? Tithes and? Offerings. <coughs> does anybody have anything besides contributions or offerings? Okay. We'll leave it there then. Your tithes and your offerings. This is a, a, another verse. You need to keep this thought in mind as we progress in the upcoming weeks. God clearly differentiates between tithes and offerings. Okay? So, so keep that, stick that in your brain. Okay? Now look at verse 9. Now remember I said this is a principle. This is the guiding oomph to the principle. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Okay, now first of all, I want you to understand the curse that you are cursed with is not a curse of sin and death. 
It's a curse that you have violated the way that God wants it to work, and so you're reaping what you have sown. Remember we started off in Proverbs and we sowed one that sows generously <coughs> receives back generously? Okay? A couple weeks ago we, we talked about, you know, you, you sow generously, you receive generously. If you sow sparingly, exactly. So you are cursed. The curse that he's talking about is this is the way it works. If you put water in your gas in your car, it's not going to go. This is the principle. Well, I don't have a gallon of gas, but I got a gallon of milk. We'll give it a try. <laughs> well, that sounds foolish, doesn't it? Why? Because that's the guiding principle. Conversely, you get up in the morning and you want to eat your bowl of... What do you eat? Cheerios. Oh, man. That... Okay, we'll make it Honey Nut Cheerios. <laughs> honey Nut Cheerios. And you pull out your bowl and you put your cereal in and you mound it up just right so it doesn't fall out. And then you go and you open the refrigerator and there's no milk. Well, I don't have a gallon of milk, but I got a gallon of gas. You see how that works for you. Don't. Please don't. I am not encouraging you to poison yourself. That was a rhetorical question. Rhetorical statement. Okay? So it's the principle. Okay? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And then verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Now I want you to pay attention to what comes next. Alright? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with this. Next week we're going to go a little bit further, a little bit more depth. But I want you to understand this. Pay attention because this is the only place in Scripture that I can find where God says, test me. Okay? Now remember, the, the devil came to Jesus in the desert and he tempted him and he tempted him and he tempted him. And he even tempted him with Scripture, didn't he? He says, you know, hey... The word says that, you know, I will command my angels concerning you. You will not put your foot upon the stone. And, and Jesus responds and he says, you will not put the Lord your God to the test. But this is one place where I see that God directs us. It's an imperative directive, meaning it's emphatic. And he is telling us, test me. He is throwing down the gauntlet before you. Test me. Okay? Because you've seen the way it works when you're managing all your stuff with your 100%. Now I want you to test me and then see what follows. Because see, this is all part of the principle. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? Okay? Put me to the test. So, so the condition is bring your tithe in. We've already talked about not bringing your tithe in. That didn't turn out so good. Bring your tithe in. This is the condition. Now the test is going to be, all right, God, I have given unto you what you have required of me. This is what he does. If I will not, I'm going to back up and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine and in the fields shall not fail to, fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Okay. See, here's the principle. If you do not do as God says, bad things happen. If you do as God says, good things happen. Okay. Now, now, one of the things that I want to stress here, it says that he's going to open up the windows of heaven and he's going to pour down a blessing on you until there is no more need. Okay, We need to understand that God is not interested in each of us becoming a Rockefeller. Okay, remember we talked last week about the unrighteous wealth, the wealth that we can't take with us, that, that really does not benefit us in eternity. And, and he said to expend that on, on the unbelievers that you might win some of them that on that day you get to heaven they will be there to greet you 
Okay? The, 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 the salvation of others is more important than your money. All right? So what he's saying here is if you bring into me what I have required of you, I am going to respond, and he is not changing, so you know that what he said here is not changing today. It hasn't changed. He says, I'm going to pour out a blessing until there is no more need. And then he goes on and he says, I will rebuke the devourer. Now earlier he talked about your purse and, and how the worm had eaten a hole in your purse and the locust had come and, and all the different types of locusts and they consumed everything. And, and he's saying, I'm going to rebuke the devourer. Now, would you rather have God step back and let you do it on your own? Or would you rather have God step up on your behalf and rebuke the one that is trying to take away from you all that God wants to give you? If you answered the first, come talk to me after. So I really want to see how your life is going. Okay? So he rebukes the devourer, and then there's prosperity. Now, please catch me right here. Please, 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 please. This is not a prosperity gospel. I am not asking that you give me anything. Okay? Okay? Quite honestly, I get so fed up with those yahoos on TV that tell, say, hey, send me a hundred dollars and God's going to give you a thousand. You know, if that principle really worked and you really believe that, you should send me the hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. I believe in a loving father that makes sure his children have what they need. Okay? Now, some of us are going to have more than others. We talked about that last week. If you are faithful in the little, he will put you over much. Some of us can handle much. Some of us can't handle little. Some of us struggle with little. Okay? So, we're out of time. Um, I want to wrap up with this, okay? Over the next probably two weeks, we're going to go through the tithing, the offering, the alms. Folks, this is a critical issue because it's so often overlooked. I'm not after your money. I'm not after your money. I'm not going to stand up here and, and say, I need your money. Okay? God has blessed this church. This church has more generosity than any church I have ever been in. I have never seen anyone walk away from this church with a need that the church did not at least attempt to meet. Most of the time, they just completely met. Okay, I'm not shaming anyone up here. I'm simply telling you what God says in His Word. Okay, God has established a principle that He desires this life to work by, and He has said it will work the best this way. Okay, so I'm not asking you for your money. I'm not going to do that. I'm simply telling you God has required of you some things. Okay. Father, we bless you today. And I thank you, God, that there is no area in our lives that you have not addressed. And I thank you, Father, that you love us enough to warn us of the dangers of doing things outside of your design, of, of doing those things that, that you have not implemented to work right. Father, I ask that you would help us, that you would open our eyes to see Open our ears to hear, Father, that our hearts would be softened to your word. Father, that we would be a people of courage and valor that would stand bravely upon the things that you have given us, the firm foundation that does not move. And I ask, Lord God, that we would be a people that would honor you, that our lives would be a testimony to your greatness, and that you would be blessed because of how we live. We thank you, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.